KLYX Radio may not have been a station of note in Houston radio history, but it had its share of talent. Barry Warner was one of its most memorable. While it didn't stay around long, legendary country station Kick 96 FM recognized Barry's worth and offered him a job the second he became available. While he did take a detour in Denver, he was only gone for two years before Houston, Texas came calling again. And when Padna Dickie Rosenfeld rings, you answer. So the sports mouth began his days as a talk show host on KILT 610 in 1988. While his days had killed to mount it to only two years, after the sports experiment didn't work out, KLOL's Stevens and Pruitt invited Barry to join them. And while it proved to be interesting work, the payoff was down the hallway that housed the Houston Oilers radio network. After that, it was KSEV with our now Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, a stint in mornings with Dean and Raj on the arrow, and in 2009, a bold move at the hands of a bright programmer put Barry back on 610 AM with a partner that was 40 years his junior. They called them the Odd Couple. And they were. Not only did Barry attract the fans he had for decades, but introduced his talents to a new generation that had never heard him before. And at the age when he should be winding things down, Barry was just getting warmed up again. An attempted retirement in 2013 didn't work well for Barry. And again, the ever-growing sports radio landscape found a place for him as a commentator on the Yahoo Sports Radio. Then, at the beginning of football season, Barry was back to the day-to-day as a host of a new show on ESPN 97.5 Radio called Reality Check. He was lucky enough to get a bit of a break today to share his latest achievement with those in attendance today. Celebrating 58 years in radio, Barry Warner is a 2015 inductee of the Texas Radio Hall of Fame. Chirp. You're only standing because you know that I'm the last one you can get the hell out of here. <laughs> Josh put me last because that way he knew I would not go on and on and on and cut into the other speakers. Wrong, Josh. I got the mic. I'm here for one reason and one reason only. Because of affirmative action. The Texas Radio Hall of Fame needed a Jew with an ARP card. <laughs> and I got my start in this crazy business. I got to live the dream that I had when I was seven years old, three weeks after my bar mitzvah in 1956 in Buffalo, New York as a gopher. And as I look around the room, I cannot take time to thank everybody because I would be here until next year's induction. I have been so blessed with so many people that I've had the opportunity to work with that have made their mark in this business. And while I prepared a bunch of notes, I started scratching them and scratching them and scratching them because everybody seemed to be on the same thing. But there's one thing that, that was left missing with all due respect to the people that preceded me. And that's the fact that those of us are a little long in the tooth Grew up in radio, where we had the huggy, touchy, feely connection with the most important people in the world, those that punched the dial and listened to us. We were able to make a difference in the quality of lives of people, whether it was a blood drive, whether it was someone, you know, saying, hey, went down to the honky-tonk and found out that this good old boy I would, would see there a couple of times a week had his truck stolen, and all of his tools were missing. The next day, we'd go on the air, someone would go on the air, Joe Ladd, and make mention of that, and the guy would get, by the end of the day, a new pickup truck and a new set of tools. The blood drives, the opportunity when a fallen hero who wore the uniform that defended our country, whether it was police, fire department, the sheriffs, whatever it was, and someone would go down. And the whole station would turn out. 
I mean, everybody. It didn't matter if you worked the, the morning shift or the graveyard shift, you turned out. And there wasn't any memo or any internet or anything. It was just, that's who we were because of that connection. And as I look at things, I, I've got to paraphrase the great Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig said in July 4th of 1939, when he was diagnosed with cancer, today is the luckiest day in my life. Well, it's the third luckiest. The first was when my son, who got into this business and had the good sense to get out of the business, <laughs> and it was now working on his doctorate in Wichita Falls, yes, indeed, my son Brent, who has gifted me beyond any amount of money that I could put on the southeast corner of the balance sheet. That was 9-11-71. The next day was December 25th, 2009. Because as a Jew, I would always volunteer to work on Easter Sunday, Christmas Eve, and pull a double shift on Christmas Day. And I was doing an interview with a former oiler star by the name of Greg Bingham, and this lady who I worked with during my, everybody in, our, in this business has had a black career. Everybody has said, and when you've been fired as many times as I have, I've been fired and rehired more times than Cher has had plastic surgery and husbands. <laughs> but I got to re-meet this with a shout out, Dr. Betty Ann Halpern, who for years was Dr. Betty for 11 years with the crazy Stevens and Pruitt and survived that. So I was a piece of cake. Uh, we've been, it'll be six years this Christmas that we live together, and as Betty says, we live in sin and not enough of it. <laughs> and then today. And there are two things. I was having breakfast with my family this morning, and I looked on one TV screen. It was ESPN with game day. Then I looked to the other, and it was CNN with the continuing wall-to-wall -wall coverage of ISIS and what happened with 127 dear souls who were senselessly killed. And all that it did was bring to the forefront something that I've always said, and why there's Jiminy Cricket with me whenever I'm on the air. Because in the shopping center of life, sports is just the toy department. And I want to close on a very somber note, but something, two things brought me to tears today. One, my dear friend, Andy Hudak, who wired a studio because I was such a diva during my, my whiskey days uh, in, in the 80s at Kick that they paid me to stay home. They built the studio over the 14th fairway at the Westwood Country Club, and Hudak built that studio. And the other were... I came damn close to losing it, and I may right now. And that is with Martini and Edmonds. Two journalists who crossed over from journalism to go into the toy department. I love Anita Martini. And I know from the great broadcasting booth in the sky, she is smiling today. But it shocked me that she was not in. How do you have a Hall of Fame without Anita Martini. She was a real journalist. She's the only person I knew that could pick up the telephone to call Joe DiMaggio and talk for as long as Joe DiMaggio wanted to talk. An amazing woman. And you see all these little eye candies on TV that today don't know whether they put air in the ball or stuff it. <laughs> Anita not only knew, she knew the poundage of air long before deflate gate. She knew everything there was to know, and she was on the air competing against me when I was working from a partner, Dickie Rosenfeld. 
I have worked for some iconic people and iconic stations. Our kick family was just incredible. We laughed, we died, we, I mean, we, we cried. Is that my thing? I'm, I'm finishing up right now, okay? We would have a bad book, and that bad book was a 15-6 or 16-1 back in those days. So radio has gone this whole circuitous route, but it still comes back to one thing. It is still the greatest medium in the world. And I am truly awed, and today I am the humble Hebrew. Thank you so much for this incredible honor.